So when you talk about making a hard-boiled egg, we're talking about the denaturation of those proteins, right? Now, when we talk about denaturation, so when, like when we talked about thermal processing, it's dependent on two different factors, right? The time you hold it for and the temperature you heat it up to. And depending on that combination will actually affect which proteins we denature. So when you look at an egg, there's about 40 different proteins in that egg, between the yolk and between the egg white. So what we're going to do today is look at two different ways to make hard-boiled eggs and to see if there's a better way or a right way to do it. So today again we're going to focus on protein chemistry. Now when... Of now why isn't this working? It was a second ago. Put that back in. All right. So, proteins now are anything, again, that are the carbon-based materials that are nitrogen-rich. So, when we talk about proteins, that pro suffix of the word describes first of kind. So, proteins are very fundamental for life, right? It's what's coded by DNA, so it's very, very important. When we talk about proteins in food science, they play a lot of very, very important roles. The first, the one that we talk about the most, is structure. So we can think of anything from egg-based products, to tofu, to meat, to cheese, to sour cream, to yogurt. All of those foods, the structure of that is dependent on the type of protein, but also on how we get that protein to set or how we get that protein to go from its native configuration to its denatured configuration. We've already talked extensively about why they're important as enzymes. They're also important from a nutritional factor, so with what biological function each amino acid serves, but also what, is, what are the limiting amino acids that are present, which we'll talk about. They also play a really, really important role in flavors. If you remember umami, that flavor associated with savory foods, that's often derived from the protein source. And, of course, when we talk about allergies or intolerance, it's the proteins we're talking about. So we've already talked about one aspect of proteins with regard to food science, and that is the color formation in Maillard reaction. So proteins, amino acids, are essential in undergoing Maillard reaction. And again, Maillard reaction is important for any time we want that desirable cooked flavor associated with reducing sugars and presence of proteins. There's other reactions that take place, which you would learn about in food chemistry, but they're outside of the scope of this course. So when we talk about proteins, and today specifically we're going to talk about the structure of proteins. So when we talk about the structure, they consist of large part of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, but also sulfur. And sulfur plays a really unique role in proteins because of the, their ability to form disulfide bonds, right? So that whole gelation of eggs is dependent on the, sulfur, the presence of sulfur. The formation of a gluten network is dependent on the presence of sulfur. So a lot of times when we talk about the structuring of protein, it actually relies on amino acids that have sulfur in the, back, in the side chains. When amino acids interact with one each other and form a covalent bond, that's formed that's called a peptide bond. And that amide bond is extremely, extremely important and very unique because the, the double bond, which we'll look at in a second, associated with that carbonyl, when, form, when it forms an amide bond, can delocalize across that amide bond and it forms a really rigid, almost like uh, double bond structure across a larger area. So we'll talk about the ramifications of that in a minute. And when we talk about the difference between a protein and a peptide, a peptide doesn't have that secondary ternary structure. So it's not a folded protein. It's in a molten globular state, which we'll talk about. So amino acids, there's hundreds of different amino acids. There's 20 that are relevant, 21, tw well, it depends how you count them, but there's 20 that are relevant to the food science and nutrition. Those 
all share, share a common homology in their backbone, and they only differ based on the side chain that is present on that amino acid. Nine of them are essential, meaning if you can't get them from your diet, your body needs to find some kind of, sorry, if you can't get them from your diet, your body has no mechanism to create them from other amino acids. And the nine amino acids that are essential are valine, isoleucine, lysine, theranine, histidine, phenylalanine, and tryptophan. And we can classify these based on six groups. And the classification is dependent on whether or not that side chain is aliphatic. So aliphatic amino acids are glycine, and glycine is a little bit of a weird one. So what's unique about glycine? Anyone remember the side chain of glycine? Yeah? Just a hydrogen. So some people will put glycine into the aliphatics. Some will put glycine into a category kind of with proline. Now what's nice about these is they all contain an aliphatic carbon chain. So these typically, depending on the chain length, reside of the inside or the core of that protein. Why? Because they're hydrophobic, right? Those amino acids have only van der Waals interactions when we talk about those side chains, and they don't want to be exposed to water. That's the same as our aromatics. Those aromatic groups don't like to be exposed to the aqueous phase. So we talk about phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. The hydrophilic amino acids, glycine can sometimes be put here, along with the hydrophilic. These also contain the sulfur-containing amino acids. These tend to reside on the outside of proteins, right? These are our water-loving amino acids. We have our sulfur-containing, our acidic. Our acidic are very, very important when we talk about food science because these, we can begin to change the charge of those amino acids so we can change solubility depending on pH. But also, we can cause gelation relying on the protonation of acidic amino acids. And the last one is proline. And proline is kind of an odd one because it's our cyclic amino acid. You can look these structures up later if you want. But all of these have implications in the functionality of that protein. So how well that protein binds water. So if you're making a meat substitute, as the case of the Impossible Burger, you have to select an appropriate profile of amino acids to ensure that you can bind water. If you want to make a gel, you have to have specific amino acids present depending on how you're going to make that gel. Are you going to acidify it? Are you going to make that gel via heating? Whatever that may be changes the amino acids we require. So because we only had one lecture to talk about proteins, I had to debate what we were going to talk about and kind of talk about the most exciting aspect. And for me, that's the structure, the ternary, secondary, and quaternary structures of proteins. Why? Again, when we talked about the nutritional aspects of foods and we talked about enzymes, when we talked about that histidine triad, remember, it's remarkable that those three amino acids that form that catalytic site, they are not sequentially placed on that peptide, on that protein, right? They're not in the position one, two, three. They're randomly distributed through that protein, and that protein has to fold in such a specific configuration that those amino acids form that catalytic triad. So the structure going from the primary, the sequence of those amino acids, to the secondary structure, to the ternary structure, to the quaternary structure, which we'll talk about, has to be remarkably controlled. And the implications of this is very high when we talk about enzyme functionality, but also very important when we talk about gelation. So all amino acids have an amine group and a carboxylic acid group. Those amino acids will always be, in foods, the L amino acid. So this, carbon car this chiral carbon will always be in the L configuration. The ability of that protein always can carry either a negative or a positive charge. It can be neutral or it can contain no net charge, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Now, a zoiterion is an incredibly important concept when we talk about proteins. Did we talk about zoiterions at all in this course? We haven't yet. No. Okay.
So a zwitterion is the ability to, to carry opposite charges on that same molecule. So you can imagine we can either add a hydrogen here to make it an NH3 plus group, or we can remove a hydrogen here and make it a negative group. A zwitterion has the ability to carry a positive charge here and a negative charge here at the same time. So imagine now having one end being negatively charged and one end being positively charged. Why would that be important? Yeah. For bonding. So imagine now you have a negative charge here and a positive charge here. You can form a very strong ionic bond. Where is this useful? When we make a gel by acidifying a protein. Oh, it was just my thing turning off. So think about tofu. Has anyone ever made their own tofu here? Nobody. So if you take soy milk or soy protein and you slowly acidify it, what will begin to happen is as you acidify it, the polarity of the amino acids changes, right? Because the side chains can become protonated in the case of, let's say, histidine. You can carry a positive charge. And as you're acidifying it, you begin to change that charge. By changing the charge, you begin to unfold that protein, right? You can get electrostatic attractions and repulsions that you wouldn't normally have had. So that protein begins to unfold. Now, when that protein unfolds, you begin to expose the inner core of that protein. That's where the hydrophobic amino acids are. So the same consequence as we cut off that capicaraginin in the casein micelle, we begin to expose hydrophobic regions of that protein. And if we expose hydrophobic regions of that protein, those don't want to be exposed to water, right? So they'll arrange themselves in such a way to minimize contact with those hydrophobic amino acids with that water core. That causes gelation, right? Protein-protein interactions. So whoop, that amino acid charge is pH dependent and the solubility of that protein is pH dependent. So depending on what we want to do with that protein, we can manipulate the structure depending on protein. Okay. So the zwitter ion, so a typical amino acid again is non-charged, we think of it. If we go into an acidic, a basic environment, we can deprotonate. If we go into an acidic environment, we can become protonated. In what environment would we form a zwitter ion? It's at a very specific pH. At its, yep, yeah, at its isoelectric point. So if we look at solubility, solubility plummets when we get to its isoelectric point. Why? Because we have a positive charge on that protein or amino acid and we have a negative charge. That causes an attraction between the proteins and a gelation. So all amino acids and all proteins have that zwitter ionic characteristic. Depending on the side chains of that amino acid, the isoelectric point varies for every, for every protein. In acidic environments though, so when you're above, sorry, when you're below the isoelectric point, you're going to carry a net positive charge. You're going to get electrostatic repulsion, you're going to get increased solubility of specific proteins. In a basic environment, your carboxylic acid will become deprotonated. You're going to carry a net negative charge. That neg negative charge is going to have the same electrostatic repulsion, and certain proteins are going to be enhanced solubility at basic pHs. Now, when you want to structure with proteins, you want to be at that isoelectric point. And at the isoelectric point, you have no net charge. What does that mean? It means that the positive charge here and the negative charge here cancel out, so we have no net charge across that amino acid or protein. It doesn't mean it doesn't have a charge. It has a charged positive end, a charged negative end, but those charged dipoles, or those charged ends, cancel each other out. 
And this becomes extremely complex depending on the protein and the amino acids. So every protein's isoelectric point is dependent on the amino acids that are present in that system. And at the isoelectric point is where we have that protein or amino acid existing as a zwitter ion. And that zwitter ion has a negative and positive charge. It has no net charge. So that's the first really, really important concept of proteins, the zwitter ion. The fact that it's zwitter ionic is extremely important. Now, when we talk about proteins, they are amino acids that are covalently linked together. So when we get that reaction, that condensation reaction, so again, we're depleting water, we're taking a hydrogen off the hydroxyl group, we're taking a, sorry, a hydroxyl group off the carboxylic acid end and a hydrogen off the amine end, we're forming a covalent bond and getting this amide bond. Now, why is that important? That amide bond is extremely, extremely unique. So when we replace that hydroxyl group that was normally here and we form a covalent bond, when we go from oxygen to carbon to nitrogen, this nitrogen is very polar. So it pulls those electrons across. Now, when it does that, it almost th you can almost think of it as a resonance structure where this double bond can resonate between the nitrogen, the carbon, and the oxygen. So this little region of that molecule becomes rigid. There's no rotation around that carbon. Okay? This is really, really important. So all rotation, when we talk about that peptide sequence or that peptide backbind, happens at this carbon only. This is the only place we can have free rotation. Why is that important? Because it limits the number of configurations that that protein can adapt. What does that mean? When we talk about, or when you talk, have taken hopefully second year biochem or first year biology, what are the main secondary structures of proteins? Anyone remember? Alpha helix, beta sheet. Do you have another one? You were going to say the beta sheet. And then this, there's the turn sequences. So again, this is extremely important to remember that those structures, the alpha helix, the beta sheet, only happen because of this restricted mobility. If it didn't, there would just be too many permeations and combinations that the likelihood of getting this regular periodic structure would be almost impossible. So because we limit our rotation to this alpha carbon, we can get unique structures like alpha helices, beta sheets. So the structure of collagen can exist because of the uniqueness of the peptide bond being rigid. Does that rigidity make sense? Does everyone understand that rigidity? So we all get that that electron can be delocalized across the oxygen, carbon, nitrogen. That delocalization causes that resonance, stable, that resonance structure that creates a rigid planar structure. All mobility, all rotation of that peptide backbone occurs because of that alpha carbon. That alpha carbon is the chiral carbon and it contains that secondary side group. And this is all really important. When I say it's all really important, it means that you're likely going to see it in a couple weeks. <laughs> okay, primary structure of a protein. The primary structure of a protein is the amino acid sequence of that peptide protein. So what we typically refer to this at this point is a peptide because it has no secondary, no ternary, no quaternary structure. So this is simply the sequence of amino acids and the abundance of each amino acid. It doesn't matter, it doesn't depend on anything else. So this gives us an indication of the nutritional profile of that protein. Is it a complete protein? Is it an incomplete protein? What are the relative concentrations of the different amino acids? It tells us nothing about the functionality of that protein. So you can imagine, you could have a cluster, or let's say you could have a very hydrophobic protein, 
But depending on how that protein folds, it may be really water soluble. If it can pack in such a way that it can create a core where those polar amino acids, apolar amino acids are all embedded in the core and you have all hydrophobic amino acids, hydrophilic amino acids on the surface, that can still be water soluble. So simply looking at the quantity and quality of that protein tells us nothing about functionality. The functionality is derived based on the presence of amino acids, their location in the primary sequence, but more importantly, where those amino acids end up once that protein is folded. So primary structure tells us nothing about functionality. Again, it tells us the size of that protein, so how many amino acids there are, what amino acids are present, but again, the sequence of that amino acid, or those amino acids in that protein, tell us nothing about its functionality. The secondary structure tells us how those pept amino acids fold onto themselves. So, all rotation is dependent on that alpha carbon or that chiral carbon where that side chain is. So because of that restriction, there are only so many ad adaptations that can be taken to form different, we'll call them supermolecular structures or how that protein folds on itself. The most famous one is the alpha helix. Now there's three different helices that are present in proteins. There's the 3.6, the alpha 3, 10, and the alpha, sorry, the, the pi alpha bond, helix. The only one we're really concerned with in the food industry is the 3.6. The alpha 310 is not a very stable helix. We're not going to talk about why that is. We're going to focus on why this 3.6 is so widely found in foods. So this isn't that important. What it's telling you is around that alpha bond, one bond angle is 58 degrees, one bond angle is 47. Again, the specificity of that bond angle is again because of the planar regions of that peptide or of that peptide backbone. So when we look at an alpha helix, we're talking here, we're only looking at the backbone. Now, because of the specificity, that rotation is very, very specific. Meaning, for every specific rise, we get a very specific turn. So if we get a one angstrom rise, we get a very specific turn that's associated with that one angstrom. Why is that important? It's important because every amino acid in an alpha helix forms this very strong hydrogen bond with the amino acid four away from it. So amino acid one, hydrogen bonds with amino acid five. Amino acid two, hydrogen bonds with amino acid six. Hydrogen bond, or amino acid three, hydrogen bonds with amino acid seven. Every one hydrogen bonds four amino acids away. Why is that important? Secondary structure, and this is extremely important, the secondary structure of a protein gets its stability because of hydrogen bonding of that peptide backbone. So beta sheets or alpha helices, the stability of those structures are dependent on the hydrogen bonding that forms between that carboxylic acid group and that amine group. And in the case of an alpha helix, that 3.6 alpha helix, every single time that hydrogen bond is going to be four amino acids away, without exception. So that's really unique, right? Think about it. You have all these different amino acids because of that planar structure, that rise and turn makes every fourth amino acid right above the first amino acid perfect distance for a hydrogen bond within that peptide backbone. So that hydrogen bond, to disrupt that structure, has to be overcome. Right? So every hydrogen bond that forms makes that structure a little bit more stable. The more hydrogen bonds that form, 
the more stable that structure is. So we're at 72 and 64, we're getting pretty close. She should be back in a second. So that, comp that conformation of the alpha helix is stabilized by hydrogen bonding between that carboxylic acid group and that amine group. Now what's important to differentiate between different levels of structure is when we talk about primary structures, they are stabilized by hydrogen bonding I gotta be careful here. Not only, primarily. In that peptide backbone. So certain amino acids are preferentially form alpha helices. So you can imagine if you have this really tight coil, those amino acids have to reside somewhere. They typically extend outward from that alpha helix. So this little gray bar would be whatever that side chain is. Here, here, going into the screen, screen, kind of coming out of the screen, really coming out of the screen, going kind of parallel. So that side group, depending on how bulky it is, will depend on what type of structure it forms. So if you have very large bulky groups, they may impede that structure or they may promote that structure. So every amino acid rises 1.5 angstroms and has a 100 degree turn. And because of that, that alpha helis has every amino acid four away being directly above, being the perfect distance to form a hydrogen bond with that second group. Whoop. So again, when we look at the alpha helix, if we get rid of all of the side groups, this is what we look at. We get this nice helix. Our hydrogen bonding would be happening all along here. And when we look here, we can see that this core, this peptide backbone, would be very tightly coiled. Now, if we introduced water into this, water would begin to compete to hydrogen bond with those functional groups. So to stabilize this, those R groups, or those backbones of those amino acids, extend out and shield that backbone from the water. So water cannot get in here to form a hydrogen bond. Make sense? So these groups, you notice they're all pretty bulky. They're all pretty apolar, meaning they don't want to be exposed to water. They shield this core from water forming hydrogen bonds because it wants to preferentially hydrogen bond with the, that fourth amino acid away. Even small amounts of water will begin to disrupt alpha helices if they're not shielded within that network. Any questions on the formation of an alpha helix? This is going to be an exam question. <laughs> so if you don't get it, put up your hand. Any confusion? Okay. Yes? That's right. So there, that, those bulky groups have to shield that water away so they don't compete with the backbones formation of hydrogen bonds with itself. Yeah. Okay. This, are we okay to start almost? This one, the 70 degree one almost. This one. So let's start this one because it's a little bit, a little bit ahead. Yeah. So we'll start. I, What's this one going to? 85. Yeah, this one's less important. This is the more. Yeah, let's start them both. Yeah. They'll be good. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to do two different sous vide eggs. So we're going to put them in at 68 degrees. What are the temperatures? Uh, 68. Yeah. No, it's at 68. 68. Oh, yeah. Let's, uh, what, did we, what did you do? 70? 70. So we've got one at 70 and one at 82. Changing this by a degree or two will have drastic effects on the outcome of gelation. So these temperatures are very, very important when you talk about the denaturation of proteins. Again, remember, how many, there's about 40 different proteins in the yolk and the white, and every single protein has different denaturation kinetics at every different temperature. So you can selectively gel certain proteins and, and not others, right? You do this all the time if you make a soft-boiled egg. You preferentially denature your egg whites, so they're solid, and then you leave your egg yolk runny. You can actually reverse hard boil an egg. What does that mean? You can make the yolk gel 
without gelling the egg white. It'll, it'll denature and it'll become opaque, but it won't become a gel. And that's what we're going to show you today, is you can actually reverse hard boil an egg, which is a really fun thing to do. And if you have a house party, you can do all kinds of really cool stuff with reversed hard boiled eggs, and you will be the coolest person at that party. <laughs> <laughs> an egg party? <laughs> all right. The second structure we're going to look at is the beta sheet. The beta sheet gets its stability in the exact same way the alpha helix does, meaning that the hydrogen bonding that stabilizes the beta sheet occurs in that peptide backbone. So the alpha helix and the beta sheet do not get stability from non-covalent interactions arising from that secondary group. The benefit or the influence that the secondary, secondary group has on the formation of the alpha helix and the beta sheep is simply the hydrophobic effect, meaning how it shields water from that backbone. It doesn't form hydrogen bonds to stabilize it. All beta sheets and alpha helices are stabilized based on hydrogen bonding of that peptide backbone. That is a very important differentiation between the, the secondary structure and when we're going to talk about the ternary structure. So the eggs are in and we're going to pull them out every five minutes and look at the structures of what is actually happening. So I'm just going to turn this on. Okay, now we won't forget. So now the difference being between the beta sheet and the alpha helix is in the alpha helix amino acid one, hydrogen bonds to five, two to six, three to seven, and so on and so forth. The alpha helix occurs along that primary sequence. So an alpha helix might be from amino acid 200 to 225, right? All of those amino acids are in sequence in that alpha helix. That's not true for a beta sheet. So what a beta sheet does is you may have amino acids 10 through 20 200 to 210 330 to 340 so those amino acids do not have to be in sequence now the structures that form still occur from the hydrogen bonding between the carboxylic acid groups and the amine groups between adjacent strands. But those strands are not sequential. But again, the primary stabilization mecha mechanism of the beta sheet is hydrogen bonding from that peptide backbone. Again, the difference now between a beta sheet and an alpha helix is that one, they're not sequential. Two, there's two different adaptations, right? There's parallel and anti-parallel. Now, from a food perspective, they're important because the denaturation temperatures are different for anti-parallel versus parallel beta sheets. So, two beta strands fold side by side, they're joined by a beta turn, and they don't have to be sequential in that amino acid profile. They're typically higher temperatures to denature than alpha helices, meaning they're more stable. Why would that be? Well, typically they contain more amino acids, they're longer, as well as, well, they're not only longer, but how do I say it? Um, so, an alpha helix may have 20 or 30 amino acids in that coil. This can have a few hundred amino acids in that beta sheet. How those amino acids line up determines the strength of the hydrogen bond. So when we talk about parallel versus anti-parallel, how those amino acids arrange each other so you can see the bond angle between the carbonyl group and the amine group, that bond angle influences the bond strain. That bond strain influences the strength of attraction. That strength of attraction is what has to be overcome when we denature that protein.
So the stronger that attraction, the higher the denaturation temperature. That strength is dependent on the bond angle. Okay, so we have our first one. Um, I'll let you do it, because I don't want to get messy. So this is five minutes at which temperature the first one? 70. At 70. So it's going to be pretty liquid, right? We're not going to see a lot of denaturation. We're, we're going to see a pretty much what looks like an uncooked egg, which is what you would expect, right? Low temperature, not a lot of time, not a lot of unfolding of those proteins. So viscosity is a little bit higher. You can see here, you can't really see it that well, but if you look here, you'll see it on the camera when I post the video, you can actually see that you have a little bit of denaturation in that clouding over here. So again, when we talk about the parallel and anti-parallel beta sheet, the arrangements of those functional groups, the carbonyl and amine, that bond strength can weaken or strengthen the strength of that hydrogen bond, and that strength of the hydrogen bond is the strength of the hydrogen bond influences what happened? It's just it's a little more. <laughs> okay, so this is which one now? That's the 80. 80. So at 80 degrees, you can already see a huge difference at five minutes, right? 80 degrees, we've rapidly begun to denature the egg whites. Egg whites have a lower denaturation temperature than egg yolks. So by going to lower temperatures for longer time, we actually selectively denature the egg yolk proteins compared to the egg white proteins. There's overlap of all of them, so it's not like you can denature one without denaturing the others, but you can see the difference already at very high temperatures. You can start to see how different the denaturation kinetics are. Okay, the third structure that's important is the turns. Typically, the more important turn is the controlled turn or the beta turn. So we have, typically, when we talk about loops, it's over five amino acids. There's the hairpin turn, which is only four amino acids, which is the one you learn a lot about in biochemistry, which typically contains which amino acid? The hairpin. Glyce, yeah. Glycine, right? <laughs> because it's got that small hydrogen group, it can form that tight alpha helis and form that, not sorry, alpha helis, that beta turn, and it forms that nice hydrogen bond. Again, any other side chain there, and it's not going to form a hydrogen bond. And then proline breaks all secondary structures. So you will never find proline in an alpha helix or a beta sheet, but you often find proline occurring just before the sequence that's involved in an alpha helix. Okay, takeaway. The alpha helix and the beta sheet are stabilized by non-covalent interactions arising from the peptide backbone. The ternary structure has two main phenomenon that drive how that protein folds. The first is the non-covalent interactions associated with the side groups. So when you have that type alpha helix and you have that side group, how those proteins fold will depend on how those side groups interact. Can they form a disulfide bridge? If you have two ionic groups that are negatively charged, they're going to electrostatically repulse. Make sense? So the ternary structure is stabilized by one, the non-covalent interactions associated with the side groups of that protein, and the second one is the hydrophobic effect. So certain amino acids don't want to be exposed to the exterior of that protein or exposed to water, right? So the hydrophobic effect is dependent on the environment in which it's in. So typically when we talk about the environment protein is in, it's an aqueous environment. So ternary structures are, are developed in a specific environment. Changing that environment changes the ternary structure. So you take a protein, you acidify it, you add a salt to it, it's going to change how that protein folds. Change the polarity of that solvent, add ethanol to it, or add a solvent to it, and it's going to rapidly change the ternary structure. So the ternary structure is highly dependent on the environment in which it's in, and this is because of the hydrophobic effect. One, you want to make sure that those apolar or nonpolar 
amino acids are removed from the aqueous phase and are shielded. So the polar amino acids adapt to conformation where they're preferentially located external to that protein. So now we're at 10 minutes. You can see, this is the 71. So you can see quite a bit more gelation of the egg white. You can still see no gelation of that yolk. So again, this is what you traditionally expect to see when you're making a hard boiled egg, right? The egg yolk gels first. Have I missed anything here? This is tricky to do this lecture, jumping back and forth between talking about eggs and lecture notes. Okay, so I'm good there. So again, you have your secondary structures form. This is dependent on the amino acids that are present, but also stabilized by the peptide backbone. How those alpha helices arrange in three-dimensional space is the ternary structure. The ternary structure is stabilized based on non-covalent interactions between the different side groups. So now we look over here. Yeah, here. Oh, these stink. I feel sorry for the next class. So there you go. So you can see now the egg yolk at a higher, egg white at a higher temperature is gelling much, much faster than what we saw, than what we see at 72. We can see the yolks still haven't st really undergone much gelation at this point. Not too much difference in the first 10 minutes. Questions on this so far? Not yet? Okay. So again, when we talk about the ternary structure of proteins, the ternary structure of that protein is stabilized by the hydrophobic effect, which is dependent on the environment it's in and the non-covalent interactions that occur between the side chains or those, that R group of those amino acids. That cannot form an ionic bond, cannot form a disulfide bond. So when you need gluten, when you're needing gluten, you're putting in shear forces. The shear forces are denaturing changing that ternary structure. When you're kneading dough, you're not changing the secondary structure of that dough. You're not strong enough. <laughs> you're not putting in enough force. So you're kneading the dough, you're changing that ternary structure. When you change the ternary structure, you're changing which amino acids are exposed to which other amino acids. So you take two sulfide groups, and all of a sudden you're kneading that dough, you're changing the ternary structure, and all of a sudden they come in close proximity, and what do they do? They form a disulfide bond. That's why gluten becomes elastic when you need it, because of the presence of sulfur groups. The, as well, you're unfolding that protein, you're exposing the hydrophobic core, doesn't want to be exposed to water, so it promotes protein-protein interactions. All of those structures of bread, of gels, of gluten, of meat, are all dependent on the secondary and ternary structure of that protein. Without it, all proteins would share similar functionalities. Water binding wouldn't be different. Gelation wouldn't be different. They wouldn't have ge different gelation temperatures. All of that matters. So when we talk about the ternary structure, we can have hydrogen bonding. We can have ionic bonding. We can have disulfide bridges. We can have salt bridges. We can have Van der Waals interactions if we have two aliphatics in close proximity. So we get a series of non-covalent interactions that arise because of the side groups of those amino acids. As well as the other important effect, which is the hydrophobic effect, or the ad adaptation of a configuration which minimizes the contact between the non-polar amino acids and the polar amino acids. Now, that protein folding, again, highly, highly dependent on environment. So, how many people here have made jello shots? It's so funny. You ask questions like, wh who's made what in food? It's like, who's done home canning? Who's made jello shots? Everyone puts up their hands. Now, there's a limitation. So, if you want to have a really fun party, you want to get everyone really, really inebriated, what do you do to your jello shot? You add more alcohol. Has anyone ever tried to make jello shots with no water? And yeah, what happens? They don't form. That environment's too polar for that alpha helix to be maintained. So if you get overzealous and say, I'm not going to put in any water, I'm going to just put in ethanol, you've changed the polarity of that network so much 
that that protein cannot adapt to configuration that's conducive to gelation. So now we're at 15 minutes. This is 72. You can see the egg white is pretty, ge not gelled, but it's denatured. You can break it. Okay, well, it'll, it'll, they'll both flow at this temperature, no? What? You cut it. No, I just want it to scrape off the white so they can see. Oh, there. Yeah. There you go. So it's starting to gel. Okay, so hydrophobic effect is important. Now, when we talk about that folding of the protein, how much beta sheet there is, how much alpha helis th there is, it changes that structure of that protein. So the ternary structure of protein gives rise to either fibrous or globular proteins. Now, if we look at 82, you can see this is pretty much gelled. The egg yolk is still pretty runny. The egg white is pretty gelled. Boy, that's toasty. But this egg yolk has a very, very soft, delicate texture. It's not like you would typically see in a hard-boiled egg. So, this, so when they say how you're supposed to cook an egg, if you heat it to about 63 degrees and leave it for three hours, that is a perf apparently the perfect egg yolk. So if you ever want to try it at home, go ahead. We're going to keep going with the structure, so I'm going to move these out. Ooh. Oh no, that's going to be gross to clean. Yeah. Okay. If anyone wants to take these eggs home at the end, feel free to grab the bag at the front. <laughs> All right. So depending on the ternary structure, will change the porosity of that protein. So if you have a whole bunch of alpha helices that are all really tightly arranged, that forms a fibrous structure. Things like collagen, gelatin, hair wool, which isn't really important for food science, muscle fiber, so meat, silk. Plant proteins are typically much more globular. They're not nearly as fibrous. So these are things like ovobumin found in egg whites. Enzymes are almost always globular. Whey proteins, caseins, globular. So there's a couple things that are really important about globular versus fibrous proteins. One is the, the denaturation temperature differs for the two of them. But so does functionality. So the ability to form a gel. There's a ton of research and a ton of work trying to figure out how to get plant proteins, which are most commonly globular, to behave like fibro proteins. That was the whole premise of the Impossible Burger. The whole premise of the Beyond Burger is being able to change that structure in such a way that that protein behaves in a way that is not meant to behave. Globular proteins, typically enzymes, denature at much lower temperatures than fibrous proteins. That's really good when we talk about deactivating microorganisms or deactivating enzymes, right? Because the higher the temperature, the more deteriorative effects that we get. We get more Maillard reaction, we get more caramelization, we get more nutrient degradation. So being able to deactivate an enzyme is important. Globular proteins are also very sensitive to pressure. So when we talk about high pressure processing, we can deactivate enzymes because they're globular. If they were fibrous, we wouldn't have high enough pressures to be able to change that ternary structure. So again, just changing the relative position of two alpha helices is enough to deactivate an enzyme because it's enough to change where those amino acids are relative to one, each other, one another, which means that catalytic triad is completely modified based on just small changes in that ternary structure. So when we talk about cooking, acidification, 
or gelation based on acidification, high pressure processing, we typically are talking about modifications and levels of the ternary structure. Whether it's fibrous, whether it's globular, will determine what that denaturation kinetics are. So this is 72 at 20 minutes? Yeah. That's okay. So now you can see the protein of the egg white is denatured, but it still flows. You can still break it apart very easily. You can see too, there's a lot of structure beginning to develop here. Still not solid, right? It's still, I can, I can move it. <laughs> so there's still structure, but it's cohesive enough that I'm not breaking it. So if you like soft boiled eggs, you might like the texture of this. Oh, I just broke it. I was playing with it too much. And now we're gonna see 83, and this is what you typically think of a hard boiled egg, right? Everything's gelling. So, yes. So 20 minutes at 63, 20 minutes at 82. Huge differences, right? So not only does the denaturation kinetics depend on temperature, they also depend on time. The longer you hold it at an elevated temperature, the more proteins that are going to be denatured. The more denaturation that happens, the more likely there is to form disulfide bronze, the more likely we are to expose hydrophobic amino acids. If we expose, expose more hydrophobic amino acids, we're going to get more hydrophobic, hydrophobic amino acids between individual proteins. The more gelation, the harder that gel network becomes. So, the effect or the shape of that protein is dependent on what amino acids are present. The balance between hydrophobic and hydrophilic matter but also where and how many amino acids of that specific type are found on that sequence. So primary sequence affects secondary structure, secondary structure affects ternary structure. Now, in some proteins, not all, we have a quaternary level of structure, or a fourth level of structure. This is things like hemoglobin, where you have a s multiple proteins, which form an aggregate. So in here we would have an iron binding it and we would have four proteins which form a supermolecular structure. That's the quaternary level of structure. Most proteins in the foods, we only have three levels of structure. Primary, secondary, ternary. Quaternary are a little bit unique. But again, still important when we talk about things like meat. Now, denaturation. Whenever we disrupt that secondary structure, that ternary structure, or the quaternary structure of proteins, that's called denaturation. Whenever we change the structure of that native conformation of the protein, that's denaturation. When you've denatured a protein, all enzymatic functionality is lost. Now what's really cool about proteins is again when you talk about that ability to form an alpha helix in a beta sheet being dependent on the planar structure, how those adapt in ternary structure is remarkable, right? Think about it. If you take, let's say, a, an amino acid, a protein that's a couple hundred amino acids in length, imagine all the different angles that alpha carbon can take. Hundreds of different, well, 360 different angles, right? Every amino acid introduces multiple angles. Now when we talk about something like ovobumin, all ternary structures of ovobumin are the same. Meaning, every single protein that has that same sequence in ovobumin adapts into an identical conformation in ternary structure. Think about the randomness. If we let that process happen completely random, we would have no two proteins that had the same structure, the same ternary structure. The biochemistry of that plant or organism has a remarkable ability to control that secondary and ternary structure, which is extremely important. So denaturation changes 
where those hydrophobic groups are, lo are located in three-dimensional space. By changing that, we change the solubility of, the uh, the solubility of that protein. By changing solubility, we change the water binding, the water holding capacity, drip loss in meat, holding of a network in a gel. That is all dependent on the ability to denature or change the conformation of that protein. This may decrease solubility, and if hydrogen groups of separate pro proteins interact, we're going to get gelation. So you can see we can still peel that egg white off. It's still pretty fluid. We'll give it the pinch test in a minute. Why does that gross somebody out every time? You don't like what? Oh, runny eggs? Oh, I, yeah. So again, you can see it's much softer. So it's getting hard, but it's a lot harder. You can see I can pinch it. It's not deforming. You can see it's kind of holding its shape when I let go now. So it's really, really soft, the texture. See? I make it a square. I don't know if I should try to pick this one up. It's, but you can see. Oh, so yeah, this one I can. Now ah, the next one. See? Cool, eh? So now the viscosity of this is becoming much, much higher. It's like, almost like that slime. <laughs> um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so gross. Yeah, do you want to grab a little bit of paper towel, maybe? Again, these eggs are free to anyone who wants to take them after. You just have to take whatever virus cold I have. <laughs> Everyone's like, no, I'll pass on the eggs. All right. So again, though, you can see that at this temperature, so at 80, you can see that this egg yolk is starting to become chalky, right? So really doesn't yield. It doesn't flow. It's really dry. So it's binding that water. This is typically how you, if you guys boil your egg yolk for two or three minutes and then put it in ice, ice water, this is the type of texture you're getting, which is not desirable. This is like velvet. It's soft. It would be creamy feeling. Much, much different structures. If you don't like soft boiled eggs, you might not like this one. Now, as we're cooking the eggs, right, we're denaturing that protein. Denaturing that protein causes exposure of those apolar amino acids. So imagine now at the interface of that egg yolk to egg white. What are eggs, what mineral are eggs very high in? Why are eggs good for us? They're high in? No. Oh, well, the albumin they have lots of, but what's the mineral? Iron. Now, iron reacts with with what? It, does, it can form a complex with, with oxygen, but not in this case. Thank you. What other, what other atom is present in proteins that reacts with iron? You can smell it right now. Not nitrogen? Sulfur. So if you overcook your egg, right? You begin to break off those sulfur groups. Those sulfur groups at the interface will react with the iron in the egg white, and you get iron sulfide. What color is iron sulfide? Green. That's why you get that little green. You've so overcooked your eggs that you've actually broken down the protein sulfur group, and it's reacted with iron. Completely safe to eat, but it stinks. You can smell. That's some of the reaction happening. But that sul our iron sulfide complex is a great indicator on if you've over-denatured your eggs. So if you ever go buy a, a hard-boiled egg from the UC and you see that green layer, take it back and say, you overcooked your eggs. <laughs> now, why is denaturation good? Well, denaturation changes the functionality of that protein, right? So we can change the water holding, water binding capacity. We can change how that gel forms. We change solubility. So a lot of proteins become insoluble. Why is this important? We already talked about why solubility is 
of milk proteins is important, right? So infant stomach, remember anyone remember what the pH of an infant stomach is? About 3.6, right around the isoelectric point of casein, just a little bit lower. This means that casein forms a gel in the infant's stomach. Why does that matter? Changes transition time. Why does transition time matter? Distension changes satiety. Why else? Viscosity goes up, gastric emptying slows, distension remains higher for longer, satiation remains, high, remains higher. Changes the rate, the micronutrient, macronutrients transfer into the duodenum, duodenum ileum. Once they get to the ileum, if it's changed that rate, it's going to change the rate of CCK release. If we've changed the rate of CCK release, we're going to change the rate of gastric emptying again, that feedback mechanism. We're going to change satiation. So now you can see it's maintaining that spherical shape, right? It's actually now becoming a self-standing gel. We can still let that egg yolk, egg white flow, right? Still flowing. This is like a tender little ball of deliciousness. <laughs> see that? See how it's holding its structure? Cool, eh? So soft, it's like Play-Doh. So what you see in molecular gastronomy now is you can take this egg yolk and you can mold it. So you'll, if you go to really high-end restaurants and they do something like this, they'll make the yolk into a little square or the really cool thing that they do is they'll crack this into a frying pan and then you have that round egg yolk and you have your fried egg white all around it. Except now it's a little ball of egg yolk as opposed to like how you typically see it as a half circle. And it looks extremely cool. So if you ever want to impress a date, make them hard boiled eggs. It'll work every time. You won't need a second date. <laughs> You won't? On hard-boiled eggs like this? Are you kidding me? Of course you would. No, this, this one's done. This, we're not going to see anything else. So really dry, really chalky. You can see it crumbles. Again, when we look at the yolk, we've got a really hard, firm gel. Here, at the lower temperature, we've got that cool yolk that is starting to become moldable but still somewhere between a liquid and a solid. So we'll dump this for the next batch. Oh. Do we, we have one more coming out of here, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, you think we can get one more on there? Yeah, the 35, I think. <laughs> okay. I feel so bad. Can you guys start to smell this yet? Yeah. It'll, it'll diffuse through the room, so the whole next class will be smelt like rotten eggs. All right. So again, changing that denaturation, or by going to a denaturation state, we change the solubility, we increase digestibility, one, because the viscosity goes high, but now because we expose those certain amino acids to that interface and we get a different effect. We get increased viscosity. So as that protein begins to unfold, it gets a larger hydrodynamic radius. The larger the hydrodynamic radius, the more likely those proteins are to bump into each other, viscosity goes up. So when we talk about why this matters, how you cook meat, the temperature, the time you cook meat for, changes that texture. The thickness of yogurt is dependent on the denaturation of the proteins. How foams are stabilized depends on if you're adding a surfactant that's a, a protein or not. Gelation, jellos, eggs, textures of bread, all are dependent on the denaturation of proteins. Extremely important. Now, we could go on about talking about functionality of proteins over and over again. For this, there's two courses you could take, Food, ca food Cam 1 and 2, or Serial Science in fourth year. You'll talk a lot more about the functional properties of proteins. Now, when we talk about the digestibility of proteins, we've already talked about the fact that pH plays an important role in digestibility of proteins because denaturation. So that happens mainly in the stomach. Once they reach the intestinal phase, we get the secretion of our main proteolytic enzymes, trypsin, uh, trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen. Why are those important or what are they called? Those are 
Starts with a Z. Zymogens. Zymogens are inactive precursors to active enzymes. Why? Because we don't want to break down the proteins in our cells. We then get our enterokinase, which, acts, which converts trypsinogen to trypsin. Trypsin then can go ahead and self-activate or activate chymotrypsin. And both of these are able to break down proteins. So here's the last one we're going to look at. You can see the egg white flows quite nicely off of it. It's been partially denatured, but now you see that egg yolk forms a really nice soft ball. Is anyone brave enough to try it? It's not touched anyone's hands. You want to try it? So it's just a soft boiled egg, right? Yeah. You can play with it too, like give it a little squeeze and tell them. It's cool structure, isn't it? I just pick it up. Yeah, go for it. It might be the whole thing. We'll take a bite, throw out what you don't want, spit it out if you don't like it. We'll just judge you. Oh, there's a shell on it on this side. That would have been gross. I hate when I get eggshell in my eggs. Isn't it a cool structure? Yes. See how cool that is? What's the texture like? Is it gross? <laughs> it's like, um... <laughs> I wouldn't have eaten it. Just um, kidding. Like peanut butter. <laughs> yeah. It's cool, isn't it? Is it good? It takes getting used to. That is actually the best way to make a hard-boiled egg. It's, <laughs> it's cool. It, do you like it or not really? You can say no if you don't. Here. It doesn't taste that different. The texture's different, the though. The texture's different, yeah. <laughs> Neat, eh? So now when you go home, too bad Thanksgiving, Christmas is coming. Everyone should include eggs with their Christmas dinner. And the one thing you can take away from this class, you learn how to reverse hard boil an egg. It's so cool. How can you guys not be excited about that? Yeah, I remember when I first read about this, I was like, there is no way this is going to happen. It was lower temperatures and longer. Yeah, so 62. And 62 is a 72 is a magic number. Like, literally changing this by two or three degrees changes everything you can think about a structure. So it's remarkable. One or two degrees completely changes that network structure. And again, you can, cut, you can create all kinds of really cool sensory properties. Yeah. How many minutes was it? That was 35 minutes. So people will even go lower temperatures for even longer times. So people will go up to, like if you go to a really high-end molecular gastronomy type restaurant, so like Albuy in Spain or something, like these five, these four Michelin stars, they will cook eggs for three or four hours at really low temperatures. Completely changes the sulfur profile, completely changes the aroma, completely changes the structure of that protein. So the only other thing I want to talk about very quickly in protein digestibility that we haven't talked about from the first part is this whole area of bioactive proteins. So when we talk about bioactive proteins, these are absorbed much like an allergen would be absorbed, but they have all kinds of biological effects. One of the most well-known is casein digestion. Casein digestion is extremely important because it creates an opioid antagonist. This is why babies fall asleep after they've been breastfed. It's because they actually get these opioid inhibitors, antagonists, that change mood and behavior. Another really, really famous one are our, sorry, are our ACE inhibitors. So ACE inhibitors you put on if you have high blood pressure. ACE inhibitors are a set of enzymes that release when your blood pressure goes too low. Doesn't matter what they do, well, doesn't matter their specific action, but what they do is they stimulate a cascade effect. So when your blood pressure drops, renin is released, this triggers anisinogen 1, and this triggers another enzyme which cha changes vasodilation. By changing dilation, you change the blood pressure. So if you can take aged cheese to treat high blood pressure, and they have as much of a biological effect as ACE inhibitors that you take from a pharmaceutical perspective. The difference being, I can't charge you $49 for a month's supply, you would have to buy cheese. So interesting, interesting application with bioactive peptides, 
lot of remarkable effects that they have. Again, this whole area is just starting to emerge. So next week, we're going to talk a little bit about the, Ontario, the Canadian Food Guide. And then, again, next Thursday...